Hello friends. This is session one and uh, with this we make a beginning in uh, the videos on uh, international humanitarian law which is a branch of public international law and it concerns uh, armed conflicts, the wars that take place, wars not only uh, between two countries, it may be between a country and non-state actors which may find support from another country. These rules relating to armed conflict situations, they have existed from time immemorial. There is a mention about them in Mahabharata, the Indian epic. It says that at uh, the sunset, the war, the fighting was to come in end. Similarly, there were rules in uh, the religious books, say in Bible, in Quran. Uh, there were rules later on the art of war. How is the war to be conducted? What can be targeted? And how the war would take place? And for that, one can go to the teachings of Kautilya in Arthashastra or even in Manu Smriti. There is a distinct Japanese code of behavior in uh, a document called Bushido. Then we move on to Battle of Hydaspes. It was fought between the Alexander the Great of Macedon and uh, Porus. Uh, who was a ruler of one of the Indian states. The battle took place on the banks of Jhelum River, uh, which is presently uh, within modern day Pakistan. It is said that Alexander's soldiers, they won the war. Porus was defeated. He came to be taken in captivity. It is said that Alexander asked Porus, how would he like to be treated? And it is the answer, the reply which Porus gave, which is quite startling. And he is said to have proudly replied that he would like to be treated as a king. Alexander was so impressed by his adversary's answer that uh, he decided to reinstall him as a satrap of his own kingdom and he further granted him do dominion over other lands. Now this was the behavior of a warrior in battle that is what is highlighted here. <clears throat> uh, moving on to Kalinga war uh, which period uh, is somewhere in 261 before Christ. This was fought between the Maurya Empire, which was then under Ashoka the Great and King Anand. Uh, and the battle is uh, said to have taken place somewhere between the present day states of Orissa and Andhra Pradesh. In the entirety of Indian history, Kalinga War is considered to be one of the deadliest going by the number of soldiers killed and wounded. Uh, it is said to have costed approximately 2,50,000 lives. And the sheer bloodshed, enormity of it is said to have prompted Ashoka to renounce recourse to war in future and he adopted Buddhism. Much later, we move to the siege of Jerusalem, where uh, the European forces during the first crusade laid siege and captured the city of Jerusalem from Fatimid Caliphate, who were earlier occupiers of that area. The siege led to the mass slaughter of Muslim and Jew soldiers, and the figures are estimated to be around 45,000. And uh, this was followed by the conversion of the holy sites on the Temple Mount into Christian shrines thereafter. 
much later uh, we see the advent of Henry Dunant uh, on the scene. He is known as the father and co-founder of Red Cross, which is a Swiss humanitarian. Uh, he was a businessman, social activist, and he did not participate in the war. It is much later after the war had ended, the next day he arrived on the scene. About that we come in the next slide. And for his efforts in drafting and promulgating provisions after a conference relating to sick and wounded in war, he was awarded the first peace prize which he shared jointly with a Frenchman called Frederick Passy. It was uh, in Battle of Solferno, 24th June 1859, that was fought between France and Austria, and uh, the battle saw participation by more than 3 lakh soldiers. At the end of the day, there were thousands of wo wounded soldiers who were injured seriously, and uh, they had just been left on the battlefield without care, they had been abandoned, and uh, in that state, they faced certain death. Henry Durant saw the after effects of this terrible battle. He set about a process that led to the Geneva Conventions and the establishment of the International Red Cross. Now, the present day International Committee of the Red Cross came into existence because of efforts of Henry Dunant and the battle led Henry Dunant to publish his book A Memory of Saul Film. Later, uh, on 9th February 1863, he set up a committee which is, came to be famously known as Committee of the Five and uh, they were set up as an investigatory commission in Geneva and uh, their task was to study, investigate, come up with recommendations as to what should be done to cut down the miseries of armed conflicts. The other four members besides Henry Dunant were uh, Gustave Moynier, who was a lawyer, Louis Apia, you see him in the picture, he was a physician, Theodore Minor, who was a physician, and Guillaume Henry Dafour, who was a general in the Swiss Army. And 13 years later, in 1876, this committee adopted the name International Committee of the Red Cross, which exists till, till day and it, it plays a very prominent part in reducing the miseries, the consequences uh, of armed conflicts. At the same time, in U United States of America, the Liber Code came into uh, existence in 1863. It was authored by a German-American German lawyer, Franz Liber, whose picture is there on the slide, uh, besides Abraham Lincoln. Uh, this was on 24th April 1863. And this code was issued as General Order Number 100 by the Adjutant General's Office in 1863 and this was so done on the instructions of the US President Abraham Lincoln during the course of American Civil War and Labor Code this clearly indicated as to how soldiers should conduct themselves in wartime, in war situations during hostilities. The next year in Europe saw the emergence of first Geneva Convention 1864, uh, which was a multilateral treaty. Uh, and that is considered as the first distinct and graphic step leading to the introduction and emergence of international humanitarian law. It defines the basis on which the rules of international law for protection of victims of armed conflict uh, should be governed. 
and armed conflict the victims generally were divided into four categories firstly those who were sick and wounded secondly those who came uh, and came to see watch the fury and consequences of armed battles at sea the shipwreck thirdly was relating to the prisoners who were taken in captivity and uh, lastly fourthly was uh, the civilians who uh, happened to be during the conflict zone at the conflict zone they could have been assisting the army or due to any other reason now the first geneva convention of 1864 after its adoption has over the years in the process sig saw significant revision and uh, there were three clear milestones of 1906 1929 and 1949 and you would appreciate that these watershed are before the outbreak of first war when the first war ended in 1949 after the second world war came to an end now geneva convention is linked to the icrc because the international committee of the red cross took a leading part in uh, its drafting and promulgation and uh, which is taking part uh, since inception uh, and it has enforced the articles of the Geneva Convention. So, the, after the initial effort, as I said earlier, in 1929, after the First World War, the Convention on Prisoners of War uh, came into existence on 27th July and it is the version of the Geneva Conventions which covered the treatment of prisoners of war during World War II because from 39 to 45 when the First World War took place it were these conventions of 1929 which were in vogue and therefore uh, they can be seen as predecessors of the third Geneva Convention which uh, came into existence in 1949. The conventions of 49 rule to this day. They were significantly revised from the shape which they had in 1929 and they are a clear step in uh, humanitarian protection for prisoners of war and uh, there are 196 state parties to this convention and as I indicated uh, there are four Geneva conventions the first convention relates to sick and wounded in war the second uh, pertains to uh, those who were shipwrecked and uh, rescued from there thirdly is about uh, the prisoners of war and fourthly, the civilians uh, who are there in conflict zone. After the 1949 Geneva Conventions to which India is the signatory and uh, India also decided to bring out its own Geneva Conventions Act and by that way, uh, in that form, uh, they became part of the municipal law in 1960. Uh, but after the Geneva Convention, the next prominent treaty is Hague Convention of 1954. It uh, is meant to protect cultural property, which is uh, located in the conflict zone. It is the first in international effort of its type, signed on 14th May 1954. It is stands ratified by 133 states and it has also two additional protocols of 1954 and 1999. It protects IHL because IHL on one hand uh, provides protection to the human beings whereas uh, the Hague Convention relates to protections uh, which are meant for uh, cultural property and uh, also it talks about permissible means and methods of warfare. 1972 was the year when Biological Weapons Convention was signed. It is a disarmament treaty, BTWC, because uh, 
It stands for Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention. And uh, this treaty was uh, adopted simultaneously at three different sites, that's London, Moscow, and Washington. It bans the use of biological and toxin weapons by prohibiting their development. Now, therefore, it is the development or research in their production, actual production, thereafter acquisition from those who have these weapons in uh, uh, their custody, transfer, stockpiling and use. All such actions are prohibited under the Biological Weapons Convention. A uh, few years later, in 1977, came two additional protocols to the Geneva Convention. They are known as Protocol 1 and Protocol 2. Uh, they were signed on 8th June 77 and these relate to protection of victims in international armed conflicts and in non-international armed conflicts. So international armed conflict is 1 and non-international armed conflict is 2. And they were also relating to the situation that ex existed during the days of apartheid. Next development was about uh, certain conventional weapons, CCW. It is uh, an international treaty which was signed in 1980 on 10th of October and saw 125 state parties as its uh, signatories. And it concerns uh, prohibitions or restrictions on the use of certain conventional weapons which are considered excessively injurious or whose effects are not uh, are indiscriminate or not discriminate it cannot what uh, in brief it relates is that the weapons should give an advantage to the user but should not result into unnecessarily unnecessary or avoidable suffering to the opposing side and that is the purpose of the ccw treaty of 1980. the scientific developments and emergence of laser technology led to protocol on blinding laser weapons and as the name indicates uh, these could have very injurious effect on the vision and uh, result in deprivation of visual capacity. Uh, this, together with the CCW of 1980, uh, this prohibits employment of laser we weapons, uh, which are especially designed in for use in combat, and that may result permanent blindness, which cannot be uh, set right again, and therefore use of laser blinding laser weapons is prohibited. Uh, another effort was with regard to the use of mines, booby traps and other devices. Now booby traps are the type of weapon which can be uh, placed at uh, places which are not suspected say on trees, at doors etc. And whosoever tries to open the door the weapon goes off causing huge serious injuries and this treaty restricts the use of land mines, remotely delivered mines and booby traps and it is also known as protocol 2. Now the land mines are put on the mines and they are covered with the mud, sand etc and anyone who steps on those land mines it uh, triggers the that weapon it goes off and it causes very serious injuries uh, so therefore uh, innocent civilians children or even animal cattle uh, can get serious can suffer serious injuries because of landmines and an effort was made uh, to stop their use there is uh, a treaty known as uh, convention on the rights of the child shortly as crc and uh, this also has an aspect which covers the use, their use in the armed conflict in the way that uh, the children can be employed in war as part of the armed forces. Well, that is not to be done and that is the purpose 
of uh, Conventions on the Rights of the Child of 1989, which saw its acceptance by 196 states, uh, apart from banning the practice of child soldiers, uh, it has aspects relating to civil, political, economic, social, health and cultural rights of the children and this is a distinct uh, jurisprudential regime that pertains to the children. 1993 uh, was the year when Chemical Weapons Convention came to be adopted. It is an arms control treaty which was signed at Paris and New York simultaneously on 13th January 93. Now, this treaty, Chemical Weapons Convention, is dealt by uh, a body known as OPCW, that is the Organization for the, for the Protection of Chemical Weapons. It is a non-governmental, intergovernmental organization based in Hague, Netherlands. It prohibits the large-scale use, development, production, stockpiling and transfer of chemical weapons. Now, chemical weapons were extensively uh, used uh, in Europe, particularly in the area of France uh, during the First World War. And uh, so, therefore, uh, these use of these weapons uh, are... Uh, not allowed in the battle and uh, the research about their use is uh, limited to be allowed for medical, pharmaceutical or protective purposes and not as a weapon in armed conflicts. Then we move to Ottawa Treaty, which was Convention on the Pro Prohibition on the Use, Stockpiling, Production and Transfer of anti-personnel landmines. Now the mines are of basically three types. Those which are used against persons or human being and they are triggered off when somebody tries to uh, step over them or uh, sort of uh, disturb them. Then there are uh, anti-tank mines which are against heavy armored vehicles and then there are sea mines which are against uh, used in naval warfare. Now, the Ottawa Treaty of 1997 pertained to anti-personnel domain. Incidentally, India is using uh, the anti-personnel landmines and they are used to give early warning in the area which cannot be covered by the soldiers to keep a visual vigil uh, from uh, any intrusion from the other side. So therefore, the anti-personnel landmines, when they blow, uh, they give an early warning when that somebody troops are coming from that area. Now, the Ottawa Treaty of 97 has been signed as signatories 164 state parties and the aim of Ottawa Treaty is to eliminate use of anti-personnel mines around the world. Few years later, uh, saw the coming into existence of International Criminal Court and the treaty in that regard is known as Rome Statute as opposed to Ottawa process which was for uh, anti-personnel landmines. Now, Rome Statute deals with four types of crime which are genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes and crimes of aggression. Further, the International Criminal Court has been authorized to carry out investigations and thereafter prosecution of uh, the war criminals. However, it is based on the principle of complementarity which recognizes that the state concerned has the first jurisdiction or first claim against the criminals and uh, ICC would only come into the picture where the national or the domestic jurisdiction is either unwilling or it is incapable to deal against that person who is suspected or who is alleged to have committed war crimes. And uh, as I said, these four crimes are known as core crimes against which uh, ICC has jurisdiction, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes and crimes of aggression. 
and this uh, by now a number of decisions have been taken and accused persons convicted after their trial by the ICC. There is also a protocol on explosive remnants of war. Now the remnants of war relate to those uh, bombs, explosives or other armament which have been used in a battle zone but for some reason they remain unexploded. Now they carry substantial risk because anyone who steps over them or uh, tries in any way even innocently to touch them uh, well they can go off and cause uh, horrific, uh, horrific uh, consequences. Now, this uh, protocol is of 1980, uh, which has seen 96 state parties joining it. There is an international convention for the protection of all persons from enforced disappearances. Now, as the name indicates, these enforced disappearances means where persons have been kidnapped or abducted by the security forces during armed conflict situations. Uh, this is basically a human rights instrument devised by the United Nations and it is meant to prevent forced disappearances uh, which amount to a crime against humanity under the international law. In the end, I would like to stress that the reach of international humanitarian law starting from the efforts of Henry Donan has steadily increased and uh, it started of course with the first Geneva Convention 1864 but thereafter the successive decades saw the better more refined and enlarged treaties coming into place and their acceptance by different member states of the United Nations. Uh, the United Nations as a collective body has taken a praiseworthy role to minimize horrific consequences of armed conflicts and in this the role of the ICRC is also praiseworthy. Thank you.